I like the meditative music. Cool. So welcome. Um, thank you for coming. It's great to see such a packed room. Um, I'm Noah Horowitz. I'm uh, Director Americas of Art Basel. Um, it's so nice to see such um, an engaged community here. I know there's a lot of Brexit voting today that some people are distracted and probably tuning into their phones. If anything major happens while we're doing this, just update us and we can take that into the conversation. Um, this is the second year that we've um, launched the Global Art Market Report in London. Um, it's the third year that we've produced this now with Claire, um, with our partners at UBS, um, something we're truly proud of. Um, and so um, thank you for, for joining us today to sort of put the context into play and, and, and to have an open discussion, I guess, to kick that off. Um, before I begin, I, I just want to welcome um, the speakers that will be joining us on stage. Claire McAndrew um, is the author of the report. Um, I've known Claire for many years. I, I actually wrote my PhD at the Courtholds. It's nice to be in this building in its fully expanded state. The Somerset House was the, the internal Inland Revenue building back in the day. So people were, except for the Courthold on the Strand, nobody wanted to come here. I think they were afraid that somebody was going to nip them on taxes that were unpaid. Now it's like an experiential place. It's great to see that development. Um, thank you so much, Claire, for all your work. Um, Claire is an extraordinary intellect, a wonderful colleague. Um, and it's not for nothing that this report, I think, has established itself really as, 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 as the, um, the report of our industry um, at that highest level. Um, I'd like to thank UBS, our, our partners in this. Um, Mark Hayfully um, is the Chief Investment Officer for UBS Global Wealth Management. He's going to um, speak for a few moments after I um, talk. Uh, we're going to have a, a panel conversation after Mark and, and then Claire presents her key findings. Um, Melanie Gerlis, um, many of you know from the FT, great journalist, is going to moderate that. Um, and, and it's a particular pleasure to be joined on stage um, by Allison Jakes um, and Stuart Shave, who are two of um, the most important gallerists here in London, really over the last 20 years, have helped um, put contemporary art really on the map. They're people that I've gotten to know very well through Art Basel and, and other things that I've done, and, and I always really enjoy spending time with them. So huge thanks to both of you, um, as well as to Vanessa Carlos, who's in the audience, who joined us here last year when we did this, and Vanessa came back. Um, so um, thanks, everybody. Um, in terms of why we do this um, at Art Basel, I think it's really important to point out that I, in the end, we just feel it's really important. Um, we believe that information about our field in, in, in the most elevated and precise ways is simply important for our industry as a whole. Um, as an organization working with over 500 galleries globally across our shows um, in Basel and Miami Beach and in, in Hong Kong through our business initiatives platform, we engage with so many different nodes of the art ecosystem that we just fundamentally feel that this is an important thing to do. It benefits us as a business, but we hope it benefits you as practitioners, journalists, scholars, um, art dealers, advisors, you name it, within the industry. Um, and that's really why we do this. And we, we feel it's important to work with somebody at Claire's level, at the highest level, to put that information out into the world. Um, to that end, the report is available as a free download on our site. Um, so it's something that's out there on your seats. You have these nice, whizzy USB sticks. Um, they have the report on them. They are not Art Basel or UBS. Um, data tracking devices. Um, uh, somebody asked, uh, I have to clarify that. Uh, they might be, but not to my knowledge. Uh, in terms of the report this year, Claire's going to uh, present in a moment the key findings, but in the end, the market was up. Um, it was up 6% overall. It was up in the dealer sector. It was up in the auction sector. Um, there were more sales happening um, ever online. Um, the British art market um, uh, uh, reestablished itself as the second largest um, art market, despite various very um, merited, by the way, Brexit concerns. Um, that being said, there's a lot of um, under our, uh, underlying um, uh, lack of clarity about what's happening in the market right now. Um, the market is increasingly top-heavy. Um, there's greater and greater consolidation at the high ends of the market. Certainly a lot of the value gains that were made last year, and Claire will go into this in depth, were made really in, in the higher price points, above a million dollars, both in the dealer and the auction sector. Um, galleries' reliance on one or two or three artists, um, which is a new bit of research that Claire delved into in this year's report, um, is really high. Um, um, and, and that's a topic we'll, dis uh, I hope, discuss um, in, in the panel that will follow. Um, gallery openings um, 
in 2018 were down 85% on, um, from a decade ago. So there's a shift in terms of new people coming in maybe to the market. Um, and there's also a change in confidence. Um, last year when Claire surveyed um, gallerists for her report, um, they were overwhelmingly the majority of gallerists about forward-looking projections were confident this past year they were less so. So there's changes within the market, although the high end and much within it remains largely intact. Um, what are the reasons for this? Well, there's a lot of reasons for this. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world nowadays. Um, I think a lot of the conversation, part of the reason we were quite committed to coming back here this year again was out of an acute awareness of what's happening in the UK right now with Brexit. So much uncertainty lingering in the background, but that uncertainty is not just a British concern, it's, it's, you know, it's a US concern, it's a concern in Asia, it's a concern in Latin America. Um, despite these things, there are a lot of um, green shoots within the markets. There are new, new, there are new markets, new global markets being developed. The first quarter of this year saw new fares alight in, in Asia, in Taipei, uh, Shanghai, or uh, Singapore rather. Um, many people were just in LA a few weeks ago for the launch of Freeze as well as Felix, a, a new young fare that uh, launched in conjunction with it. And of course, many in this room, myself obviously included, will be going to Hong Kong in two weeks um, for Art Basel's show in Asia. Um, there are new developments in the technology side. Claire has done a really adept job, I think, in this report, not just looking at top line, online, or e-commerce related sales, but all that's happening um, in, the, in the tech space within the art world. Um, I had breakfast on arrival yesterday with Daniel Birnbaum, who's a close friend, is a former director of the Moderna Museet, um, who's now working in this building for a company called Acute Art that does VR um, technology stuff. And it's extraordinary change in our industry to see a, a super established museum director, former curator of the Venice Biennial, now working for a technology startup. That's pretty cool. Um, and there are new avenues or new things happening. Artists of color had a, had a tremendous um, gains in, in the institution, the marketplace in the last year. Female artists, which is um, a, a part of um, what Claire has tried to look at in greater depth in her report this year, um, have made certain gains, but Claire's research also suggests there's a lot of ground to make up. Um, so there's a lot happening. Um, in terms of new things for the report this year, um, there's a wonderful bit um, that, that we've developed or Claire developed in partnership with UBS that really looks at different wealth trends. Um, and I think there's a lot more to be done there in the future as well. So I direct all of you and those following online to, to really try to look at not just the top line figures, but to, to uncover these different avenues that Claire has laid out in this report. Um, to that end, I think it's always important to underline that so much of our business happens beyond the big numbers that we see. There's a lot of nuance to what we do as an organization as Art Basel, but what all gallerists and different art market practitioners do. So I hope you as readers um, and as practitioners um, are as acutely aware of that as we would like to think that we are as an organization. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Mark now um, from UBS who's gonna give a, a few words. Claire is then gonna, for 10 or 15 minutes, present her key findings and then we'll all get on stage um, for, um, for a round table. But thank you so much for coming. It means a huge amount to us and um, have a great day. Hi, thank you for having me here. Uh, Mark Hayfley, I'm the Global Chief Investment Officer for UBS Global Wealth Management. And uh, it, it's my honor to represent UBS here. UBS, as you know, has been involved with Art Basel for 25 years and a partner with the Art Market Report since 2017. And, you know, I think the question might be, why is UBS so involved in art? It's uh, certainly a passion for many people. It's a passion for our clients. And as I travel the world, meeting with our ultra high net worth clients, there are many things in this world today that bring us apart, but art is one of those things that can bring us together. Uh, another touch point for me personally, uh, since I'm, as chief investment officer, I'm more involved in the Apollonian rather than the Dionysian aspects of uh, what goes on at UBS, is that uh, UBS has an amazing art collection, 30,000 works spread across the world. And, you know, it can be the middle of the night in Hong Kong and you're walking down a hallway on your Blackberry and then you just stop for a second and you say, hang on, what is that on the wall? And it, and it can just touch you at uh, stressful moments, difficult mo moments, or joyous moments. And 
you all know that about art better, better than I do, but it's, it's certainly something that I've been engaged with and increasingly interested in uh, in my time at UBS. Now, the final thing I'll say uh, is art is a different market than what, what we see in the financial markets, and that was a good thing last year because the financial markets had a very difficult year. I think the only uh, things that you could say went up in terms of uh, assets were art and uh, fine wine and then maybe cash in the United States. Um, this is still a very, it, it, we don't invest in art as an asset class at UBS, but it's, it's a fascinating subject because what Claire's done is put together so many transactions and, and it's really when you have these transactions and you see what goes on at the point of sale that you get price discovery but also a lot of information. And what's fascinating to us are these trends in where the wealth is, how it's changing over time, and those are things I hope we can get into a little bit today. So like you, I'm here to learn, and with that, I'll hand it over to Claire. Thanks very much, Mark and Noah, for the introduction. Um, and I want to do a very kind of a quick tour through some of the key findings of the report. There's obviously a lot in it, and um, it's quite a dense uh, book this year. So we've had a lot of different findings, some positive trends, some negative. So I wanted to do very much the, the, the top line, but introduce some of the other interesting facets of it as well. Um, as Noah mentioned, um, looking at the big picture, it was a positive year overall. So this is the second year of growth in the art market. The art market rose 6% last year to 67.4 billion. So that Two, year, two years in a row of growth has brought it up to its second highest level in 10 years. Um, one of the reasons why the growth wasn't maybe as strong last year as it was the year before was there was quite a mixed picture regionally. So we, this is one of the defining trends of the last few years, and you've seen it in the reports, is that the high end is doing better than the, the middle and low ends. But another feature this year was regional um, divergence in performance. So these two things together, when, when the whole thing's not going up together and the whole thing's not going down, they, they produce more muted growth overall. And this is these divisions in performance caused the slightly more muted growth than we saw the year before or we've seen in previous years. Um, just looking at the regions, I suppose the star probably of last year was definitely the US market. It reached its highest ever level. Um, the growth rate in US sales, this is sales on the ground in the US, was 12%, so twice the global average. It was growing twice as fast as the world on average, and it reached 30 billion, which is, as I was saying, is its highest level um, in recent years. Um, the, the auction sector did well, fine art auction sales in the US grew by about 17%, and the dealer sector did well, growing by nearly 10% nearly in, in dealer sales as well. Um, and the US is getting all the things that it always got right, right in a way, so it's a, it's a strong base of wealth, high net worth wealth, and also the wealth at the kind of uh, more upper middle and middle levels as well, so it's got depth as well as the very high net worth wealth. Um, it's also got all the cultural infrastructure and expertise there, and it also gets the regulatory balance, I think, very, very well balanced between protecting consumers and allowing it's a very business-friendly place to transact, and, and art flows in and out of the country relatively easily compared to other countries. So it's all the, all the good things it's always done, it, it's continued to do. Um, China, I suppose, is one of the most interesting, fascinating ones to, to watch for me over the last 10 years, especially just the, the kind of very volatile and amazing growth it's had. If you look back to 2000, it hardly registered on the grid at all. Then in 2006, it overtook France as the third largest art market. Um, and it's really been a phenomenal one to watch. Ever since then, it's been in the top three. It's kind of altered its position a little bit, but it's always been one of the top three markets. Um, the dealer and gallery sector in China is much smaller. It's still only around, around about 30% of sales, and that did okay last year, but the dominant auction sector had a fairly large mm -hmm. decline of around 9%, and that, that muted growth in China as well. So it, the whole market as a whole contracted 3% to 12.9 um, billion. So it's been, it's been very much an up and down marketplace, and I suppose it, it probably acted a little bit more like a normal market. There was a lot of things kind of feeding into the sentiment. Um, you know, demand was still very strong for the highest quality works, but like in, in every marketplace, there's a shortage of supply of those, of those works, and that this was very much the case in the auction sector in China last year. And it was a more cautious um, buying environment. There was various things looming on the horizon, debt crisis, the trade wars with the US, all these things filtered down into sentiment um, very much, and 
this uh, caused the market to slow down. I, I think when, when you look at it over 10 years, I'm not sure if it's that, that visible there, but it's still, um, it's still grown phenomenally if you look at it relative to other marketplaces. So it's grown by about 130% in size in the 10-year period. So it's beginning to, in, in my opinion, a little bit more normalize, act a little bit more like a normal marketplace rather than this kind of frenzy of consumption that we had, especially up to 2012. Things are kind of starting to moderate, starting to go up and down a little bit more like you might see in the US or the UK. Um, looking at the UK, um, it performed very well, particularly with all the things on the horizon here with the Brexit worries and things like that. It had a relatively strong year of sales. So sales were up 8% to nearly 14 billion. And again, that's the second consecutive year of growth here in the US, in the UK, sorry. Um, it's still lagging the US. So if you look at from 2009 to, to 2018, the US grew by about 145%, whereas the UK was much more um, uh, lower than that. It was 55%. But um, I think it was very interesting when you take the UK out of the EU in the period from 2009 to 2018, that actually declined. So this is a major worry, I think, what's going to happen now um, after Brexit to both the UK sales and to the rest of Europe. Um, and obviously, talking to dealers and from and auction people and from, from the surveys as well, the, the feeling was that um, a lot of the, the bigger businesses will probably be fairly okay. A lot of uh, businesses that have multiple premises elsewhere will obviously be able to kind of arbitrage their, their sales and things no matter what happens. And from this research and other research I've done with BAMP, we found that you know, the imports and exports, about 80% of the value of those are extra EU anyway. So th I suppose the worry is the trade policies that are going to be in place for intra-EU trade. But the fact is 80% of the value of imports and exports to and from the EU in the art market in the UK are extra EU anyway. So they're somewhat insulated from what pans out in the next months if we do even get a clear picture then. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of talk of, of perhaps a new market in Europe kind of stepping up to the plate and becoming the new center for sales. But I mean, as, as has been the case before, the, all of the markets in Europe have been operating on a fairly level playing field up to now. So they've had the opportunity to step up to the plate before from things like import VAT, resale royalties, all these things, and nobody has done it to date. So it, 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 it's a kind of, it's a, it's, it remains to be seen, I suppose, if that will materialize. And I think some of the things that were wrong with markets as far back as the 1950s and 60s are still the problems today of overregulation and complexities and things like that. They still, um, it's still those same things that are driving where the money is and how easy it is to transact still drive a lot of the sales today. Um, Talking about these, these things, what, what drives sales, um, these three entrepot markets um, of in, the, in the world now dominate the market so much. I mean, these, all these different patterns of growth fed into sales. Obviously, the U.S. pulled away again. It's now 44% of global sales by value. Um, this kind of shuffling of position between the U.K. and China happened again because China had a poorer year than the U.K. It fell back to third place. But I suppose the most interesting thing is just the dominance of these three big trading hubs. And I mean, the success of markets such as the UK is not built on necessarily on domestic sales. It's built on, you know, uh, buyers and vendors coming from elsewhere and, and they're assembling a critical mass of sales here in London or in New York or in Hong Kong um, for, for, the, for the buyers and sellers to come. So it's, it's the, their, their success as entrepreneur markets or, or kind of uh, trading hubs as much as anything that's driven this, this dominance of these three big markets. Um, so that's regionally. The other thing that muted growth a little bit was the um, differing performance by segment. And this has become a, a very much the defining feature of the market over the last few years has been the, I mean, it's always been the case to some extent, but the divide is widening. So the, the mood of the market was, as Noah was saying, was a little bit less optimistic. Um, a lot of things weighing in how the markets were performing and the general economic and political situation in a lot of countries and around the world. Um, and this, often this kind of nervous uh, climate often feeds better into the dealer sector. So people tend to transact more privately when they're unsure of what's going on because I suppose the, the, the benefits of the auction sector where the sky's the limit are slightly more, um, less attractive when, when you don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, if it's, if it's a very booming marketplace, sky's the limit, and you may as well take something to auction, you'll get better than you expect. But when things are a little bit more um, unsure, people tend to veer towards private sales. And we saw the dealer sector doing well overall. This kind of fed into that. It rose by 7% on aggregate. But as you can see from the, from the chart, there's vastly different performance 
depending on the segment of the art market. So, so the, the best performance, again, being seen for um, all those dealers with turnover over 500,000 and for those with less than 500,000 negative growth year on year. And this, this is, again, is a kind of a consistent feature. It's kind of, it, it's moved back a little bit, the, the divide, but it's still a, a very much a, a defining feature of the market. And the best performance overall year on year, according to the surveys, was the, the segment between 10 and 50 million and the worst being this very lowest end of less than 250 million. And it's the same in the auction market. It's very much um, <coughs> uh, value dominant in the high end and volume dominant in the lower end. So it's a similar picture there. I mean, the, the auction market as a whole was slightly less buoyant. It was but still advanced 3% year on year. So that was substantial growth of 29 billion. But you can see here, um, this, the, the volume is at the bottom end. Um, you know, 92% of the works sold on the fine art auction market last year were for less than 50,000, but they were only 10% of the market's value. And 61% of the value of the market is for works sold over a million. So it's very much a skewed marketplace. And as I said, the defining feature of, of the market is this divide between the high and low ends. And you can really see this over, um, I did a little bit longer than 10 years here. I went back to 2005 just to show you how the market has performed. This is again is fine art auction sales. And apart from the very, very lowest end of, of work sold for less than a thousand, all of the, the, um, the other markets have seen kind of negative and, and volatile growth, whereas the high end has, has grown. It's been quite volatile, as you can see. This is the, the, the line at the top is as things sold for over $10 million, but it's by, by far has been the, the fastest um, growing. And if you look at the period just from 2008 to 2018, all of the, um, the segments up to 250,000, apart from that very, very low, less than $1,000 segment, have shown lower negative growth rates versus the market for things sold for over a million. Um, it's grown at the highest. And again, the, the market for work sold over 10 million growing the highest overall, it increased by 133% over 10 years. So, so what's happening is the market's becoming a lot more skewed than it was, say, for example, 10 years ago. This, this high end, as I said, is now things priced at over a million or over 60% of the market, whereas if you look back to 2005, they were only around a third of the market. So it really is, it's becoming, the high end is growing bigger, and that's at the expense of the, the middle and lower ends are getting squeezed. I mean, of course, some of this is natural inflation, so things are getting more expensive. So obviously more stuff gets, the goalpost stays the same, so more things go into the, into the million plus segment. But it does show very much that where the growth in the market has been. Um, so, with this in mind, I, the, what, what's been happening is the high performance and the, the um, best sales growth has been at the high end, and I suppose that the most sluggish performance at the low end, and, and this is where most of the risk is, and we looked at that in another way um, this year as well with the surveys. We asked galleries um, how much of their sales are attributed to, diff to, to artists, just to show the kind of precarious position that some smaller businesses in the art market are in. And it was very interesting finding in, in relation to that, that at the lowest end of the market, I think Noah mentioned this, that 64% that, you know, of, of their sales were from their top three artists. I mean, that declines as the size of the gallery increase, but it sh shows what a risky position some of these, with, with the low performance of sales year on year, plus the dominance of, of and reliance on just a few artists, the kind of the, the risky position these galleries are in. Um, and I mean, this feeds into the, the point Noah also mentioned about the, the number of gallery openings um, declining. I mean, it's quite, one of the biggest things that comes out in the surveys and in interviews every year is a problem with access to financing. So galleries can't get banks to lend them money. They can't access inventory financing or any kind of financing from banks. They really struggle. And this is not just the primary market galleries. It's the antique dealers and decorative art dealers very much so as well. This is something that they, they always say every year is that they continue to have problems with banks not lending them money. So unless they have an investor or some kind of other access to finances, a lot of them are struggling to survive. And you can see that combined with the, the amount of sales that, that are attributed to, to you know, one or two artists what a risky position they're in. And I think this has had to have fed in a little bit to it perhaps not being as attractive a proposal as it might have been 10 years ago to open a gallery or just more difficult unless you have some other kind of form of financing. I mean, there's a lot of other things going on online and stuff that's also driving this trend, but it's, it's just, it's just it was very evident in those findings how 
risky it can be if one of those artists gets cherry picked by a by a larger gallery. You know, 45% of their sales are disappear, you know, more or less overnight. So it's a very it's a risky business for a lot of the smaller galleries. Um, one thing that, just on a slightly more positive note, just to notice how dealers are making sales. I mean, the gallery is still the main um, uh, conduit for sales, with 48% of the, the sales made by galleries they reported. This is a, a turnover-weighted turnover average, um, and 46% through fairs, and that's been the, the a kind of a growth channel for, for dealers. It was um, about 30% in 2010, so it's increasing um, as, as time passes um, and with it art fair sales have also increased and they continue to do so last year they rose six percent to 16.5 billion but again alongside that is increasing costs to attend fairs and we've been tracking this for the last few years so the cost to attend fairs also um, increased by five percent so the the returns are not kind of advancing that much because the costs are rising in in, in line with the um with the sales. Unfortunately, again, there's this problem of the top-heavy nature that a lot of the sales increases are not necessarily spread throughout galleries. So the costs are more evenly spread, but the, the sales advances are very much at the high end. But there, there is some moves, and I discuss it in the chapter in the report that, that fairs have made this year to try and address that problem and to look at the how to structure their, their costs in a way that um, accounts for the size of the gallery and the kind of the space that they're accounting for. So, I mean, Art Basel have done it and Freeze and a lot of other fairs have been moving in the right direction. It's not going to solve all the problems overnight for smaller galleries, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And it's a recognition of this growing divide in the marketplace between um, big and small galleries. Um, another very positive um, element is the growth in online sales. Um, this is an expanding component for dealers and auction houses. Um, sales reached six billion, so that's an increase of 11% year on year. Um, they still account now for quite a small share of global sales overall, um, about 9% of global sales, and that's a little bit smaller than, say, retail is. Retail um, e-commerce generally is about 12% of, of regular retail. Um, and this is because, again, prices for online selling tend to be in the middle to lower ends of the marketplace. But that, that is growing. There's some evidence of collectors being uh, willing to spend higher prices. And we saw that especially, we did some really interesting research this year. Um, together with UBS, we surveyed high net worth collectors. Um, we've done this for the last two years in the US, but this year we had panels of five different countries, um, Germany, the UK, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. So we were able to survey high net worth collectors in these markets. And um, you know, most of them still hadn't um, exceeded around 50,000. I think it was 72% hadn't exceeded 50,000 online. But there was 17% um, you know, of the sample had bought something online in the last two years for over 100,000. And there was a small but very significant percentage of 4% had bought something, had spent in the last two years over a million on works of art online. So it's not the densest area of the market, the, the high end, but it is, there's evidence that it's, it's there in some capacity. And this was really... Um, interesting to see. Um, by, by far the most likely to be online, of course, was probably the millennium collectors, and over 90% had, had transacted online in the last two years, versus, for example, boomers, where the majority hadn't done a transaction online. Um, so it, they're very much, uh, they came out of these surveys as the most active across all segments. So millennial collectors had, about 70% of them had purchased fine art in the last couple of years. 77% had purchased decorative art, and I thought was really kind of reassuring is that, or positive, optimistic at least, was 54% had purchased antiques in the last couple of years. So that would be a very much a traditionally kind of older sector of the art market. So this was a really positive finding. Um, it was a, you know, it's a small sample of people, but it's still, they were active, high net worth individuals um, that had been active in the market for the last two years. Um, but a lot of very interesting findings um, in that, um, chapter chapter seven, and I suppose the real benefit, which was great this year, was seeing how things are different between a range of different countries. And what we found out is that, that they actually had more in common with each other than they did with people in their own region. So millennial collectors had more in common in terms of their preferences, their buying activity, what they wanted, how they wanted to transact, how much they transacted with millennials in other countries than they did with people in their own region. So it was really interesting to have that cross-country comparison this year to, to see that. Um, the final thing we always look at is the economic impact, and that, that held steady. 
Um, the, the market still employs around 3 million people. Went down fractionally in the auction sector and up a tiny bit in the dealer sector, but it held fairly steady. And you know, it still um, spends uh, a vast amount of money in ancillary spending in all the specialized services that, that go around the art market, whether it's art fairs and packing and shipping and all the kind of businesses that are developed around the art market. So it makes a huge economic impact. Um, another positive thing about the employment dynamic is that it is, while um, in, in the world or in the EU, um, women are a minority of employment, in the art market they make up a majority in most sectors. Um, now some of these you might say, well what kind of jobs are they actually doing? So, it's, so for example in top tier auction houses, 65% women, in dealers 61% women. But beside this, besides the top tier auction houses, a lot of the dealer businesses are small businesses, so they don't have a lot of... Um, you know, the employees are all in, in kind of equal or, you know, it's not a hierarchical um, uh, companies in a lot of cases. So this is a very positive finding um, in the report. And we did look at gender in various aspects in, in the report. And I'm, that's probably about the most positive thing we found. <laughs> that's, that's where it ends, I'm afraid. Um, so we looked in the auction sector, and this has been done before. Um, you know, it's been done, it's, it's, it's quite a, uh, you know, academics and, Roman Krausel did a bit of work with us again. He published a paper a couple of years ago to show the big gender discount um, for women in the auction sector. And only 5% of the value of the market in 2018 was from female um, artists. This is in the fine art auction market, not the auction market as a whole. Um, and you can see there that as the price level goes up, the share of women goes down. So it's not just, it's, it's not just an overall thing, it's, it's the, where they're being priced. Um, so that, that was fairly well established. And I mean, the, the, art, the fine art auction market is a lot of secondary, and obviously it's all secondary sales, but it's a lot of older sectors as well. So in some ways that's not that surprising because there's less female artists in older sectors for various reasons. They weren't allowed in, in a lot of institutions until um, the 1900s in some cases. So that wasn't that surprising. But what, what we wanted to add was to look in the, to the dealer sector. And um, what we, we found was a similarly um, poor picture in terms of representation. So if you look at, this is, um, we used data from Artsy to look at whether the artist was established or not. We used whether they had an auction record or not. And you can see that for non-established artists, the artists just selling in the, in the primary market or in galleries, the, um, the rate of female representation was 36%. But when you move to the established artists, these are artists with an auction record, it goes right down to 16%. So that's not a great representation there. This is using data from Artifacts. And again, there's always kind of two ways to look at this data. You can look at, this is how women are represented in ex exhibitions over time. I mean, you can say, look at the progress that's been made from 1900, only 4% of women in global exhibitions um, up to the current 33%. So we, there's progress being made, but you can also say, you know, why in this day and age is it still 33% representation? So there's kind of, there's progress being made, but there's still, as Noah pointed out, a long way to go. And it was, it was, a, it was just the beginning of, of tracking these things. I think there's, there's been sort of sporadic attempts to look at gender in the art market. So this is something that, you know, we're not just doing it for this year. It's something that we want to track over time to see if hopefully that might change. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, you can all hear me. Thank you very much, Claire, for again, yet again, packing uh, an enormous amount of information um, into this year's report. And thank you all um, for coming. As Noah says, it's a busy, it's a busy week. Um, Noah did briefly introduce us. I'm Melanie Gerlis. I'm a journalist. And then I'll start to Noah Horowitz, you've met. Mark Hayfully from UBS uh, Private Wealth Management. Stuart Shave, who runs Modern Art here in London. Alison Jakes, another very prominent dealer here in London, and Claire McAndrew, you know. Um, and I just want to, I mean, it's, it's fantastic to see a second year of, of, of growth in the art market, um, but it's always more nuanced, I think, than, than the, the top numbers show. Mm -hmm. So it would be great, really, to start, Stuart and Alison, to find out a little bit about what is happening on the ground. Um, I suppose, Stuart, I mean, could you... 
we discussed earlier, are you both, you're both happy to be defined maybe at the, the higher end of that turnover list that uh, Claire showed us, if not at the very, very top end. How was the year for you? And maybe you could talk a bit about this, this like as you were a smaller gallery once, this reliance on, on one artist. Well, certainly when we um, opened 20 years ago, the, the gallery was probably heavily reliant on one or two artists. Mm. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting, it's not something I've really been thinking about, so I, I did start thinking about it when I saw your mm. email yesterday in, in looking at my own um, program. I, I, I kind of feel quite satisfied that I'm not reliant on one mm. artist, but I, you know, have seen, certainly there are cases where uh, in the past we have stopped working with uh, an artist for one reason or another, and, and you know, that has... Uh, that can have a profound impact mm. and, 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 and thus, um, you know, when an artist is uh, stolen or taken or maybe there's a kind of co-representation offer on the table, I can see the impact that that could have. And so, you know, m my advice to any younger gallery would be is to try and not have your egg in one basket, mm. but have many, mm. uh, you know, I mean, there have, there, there have been suggestions in the past of paying a sort of transfer, that the bigger gallery should pay a sort of transfer fee uh, to, to a smaller gallery. Is that the sort of thing you would be... I think that, that that could be a possibility. I mean, also, I mean, I would be inclined, if that happened to me and an artist took my gallery, I probably would, would just want to close the door and kind of walk on. And, mm. um, but I can see that in particular circumstances that could be incredibly mm. useful and life-saving for the gallery. And can I ask, I mean, how was the year for you? I mean, you, where, do you see that sort of moderate growth? Yeah, I mean, we do. I mean, on I've been open since '98, and this last year was our best year. Yeah. So, I mean, that concurs um, quite strongly with that. But it, it's interesting that you brought up the word nuance <laughs> because there are so many nuances mm. within um, within all of these demographics. And like, I guess I can't speak about the report, but I can speak about about those. Was there any one show, fair, exit, was there, or geography that made that your best year? Uh, it was down to a couple of gallery shows. So if you looked at our data for the last year, you would probably see that our exhibition proportion of the pie chart was um, very, very strong. Mm. And if, in fact, I did look at it yesterday, and it was, you know, 50-50 with, with art fairs. Um, but of course, the main thing about gallery shows is, is that you don't have the same overheads as what an art fair has. Yes. But um, you know, this the reason why it's nuanced is because you know, different artists show different years. So it's like you know, some of the artists that helped make 2018 a really strong year, I may not show them again you for another couple of years. So it's it's great. It's uh, yeah, it's case by case and very nuanced. I think. Thank you very much, Stuart. And then, Alison, just picking up on some of that again, how was your year? Did you also have your best year ever? Um, well, I suppose we learned... I mean, I, I recognise the chart from the, the profound dip, and I think it was 2009. OK. Um, and I remember that moment when the phone stopped ringing and mm. no one came through the door. And I think it wasn't about people not having money at that point. It was about it not being seen to be the right thing to be spending it on in large amounts on contemporary art. Mm. So... Um, I don't really recognise the next dip because mm. I think we found, because we changed our model after that recession in 2009. How can you? Um, well, I recognise that the bubble had burst for young contemporary artists or solely relying on young contemporary artists and that perhaps it was a less is more model and to, to, look, to just look at great artists regardless of whether they are female, male, or dead or alive, actually. Hmm. Or whatever age they are, you know, you can find an 85-year-old artist who can be equally as important as someone who's just had a lot of exposure and has, you know, had a highly successful market moment. Um, it's much younger. So I think primarily I started to think about just going back to my curatorial roots and just looking at artists and showing artists who were really interesting, who didn't necessarily have a market hmm. or who hadn't necessarily been even successful in their own lifetimes. And so that was the fundamental difference. And I think the knock-on effect of that is I just noticed that people were looking back. They weren't always looking forwards. Yes. And that I started to see gaps. 
So it wasn't like I was looking for female artists. Mm -hmm. It's just that if I look at um, artists who were perhaps working in the 70s, 80s, or, you know, there were just more female artists, great female artists, who hadn't been mm -hmm. discovered. Overlooked. Whereas there are a lot of great male artists who'd had that exposure, mm -hmm. who'd had those opportunities. So my, my experience in the market right now is similar to Stuart's. Mm -hmm. I would say that I think our, our year doesn't go calendar year. It goes from the 1st of May through to end April. So that's, that's how I judge our financial yeah. year. Last year, we had our best year ever. And yeah. this year is looking like we might top it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and I, I just think it's not... I mean, we look at market reports, but I just really do believe that you have to do your own thing and think outside the box. And if you have the right artists and you have things that are really interesting and have not yet been necessarily fully appreciated, you're going to then be on a trajectory of up. Because mm. the more you achieve for your artists, and that's tandem, whether it's market or curatorial profile, museum shows and museum sales are absolutely fundamental. Um, you're going to your gallery, if you have several of those artists, and I totally concur with Stuart about not putting all your eggs in one basket. Mm. I've learned from that because we did have one year when that was the case. But when it you puts lost, you in a very you precarious. Yeah, okay. But you, um, you didn't. We've never lost an artist like that. But you were saying it, it's tough. You have to fight your corner sometimes. Well, I think that's the challenge for galleries in this bracket. Yes. Is like, you know, we're in the kind of that second column of 10 to 50, and those people above us, or those people at the upper end of that column, mm. it's. it's it's difficult. They've got overheads. They've got multiple spaces. They've got lots of staff. The art fairs are really expensive to do. And we're the kind of galleries that are building artists' careers often from scratch, which means also their markets. Hmm. And I think the biggest danger at this point in, in, in our gallery um, sort of history is how do you ring fence yourself so that not only do you achieve that success in collaboration with your artists and estates, but that you preserve it and that someone else doesn't come along and profit from all the years of work you put into mm -hmm. building that market. So you're actually in a, arguably a riskier position than some of the smaller, w well, established... Well, there's more to lose, potentially, yeah. because you might have expanded, you might have a bigger space, you might have more staff. Um, but at the end of the day, that's why I do, the transfer fee thing is interesting, mm -hmm. but I would argue that I just hope I'm never in the position yeah, where I do a transfer fee. And... You know, in the last five years, we've suffered. We, we, we've, you know, we've experienced three, and two of those were major takeover bits by major galleries of important artists for us. Um, and you just have to, you just have to make sure you, you ring fence your relationships and that you deliver on all levels. Therefore, they won't see the need to go into a huge pond where they're going to be a much smaller fish. Hmm. And you, it's interesting you say that you haven't sort of deliberately, because I noticed you've got more than 50% female artists. So you're an well, outlier. Yeah, I've got 13. I looked yesterday. I've never <laughs> even studied it in all honesty. So ahead of this, I did look. I've got 23 artists and 13 are women and 10 are men. Yeah, but it is, I mean, both of you really, do, what do you think are, is the stumbling block still? Is that something you see? Well, it, I, I was also kind of looking at my mm. um, list of artists and thinking that I... I was thinking that I did represent a lot of female artists, mm. and actually when I looked at the list, I realized it was a third of oh, my okay. gallery. Oh, okay, okay, so maybe it's... But the interesting thing that came, came out of looking at that is the three biggest markets I feel that I've built, and our three biggest turnovers are all women. Considering so, your Venice. Well, see, yeah, like someone like Eva Rothschild yeah. or Jacqueline Humphreys, uh, you know, so I, I, I also think that that's, you know, that's quite significant. I mean, if we're talking about graphs and... Mm. Who's at the top of the graph? Then you know the first three names are, are females. I hope you've seen Claire's top. By the way, yeah. so girl, <laughs> girls can do anything. Um, no, we're we're hearing you know fairs are expensive. Um, dealers are doing have done fewer fairs, but are making more money. I, you know, what is an art fair meant to do when people are saying, "Oh my gosh, there are nearly three hundred art fairs. We're exhausted. There's market saturation. You need to rein it in." <laughs> What's your answer? Well, I think, is this on? Is that on? Sorry, I just muted it out. Is Mark's on? Ah, that's on. <laughs> um, Does that work? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot that one can say on this topic. I, I think the, the one thing that I'd 
train everybody's attention on really was, was the, um, at the end of the dealer chapter, Claire summarizes the, I don't know, I think it's eight to 10 kind of key things that dealers are focused on for the coming year. And the number one thing that dealers are concerned about above and beyond um, anything else is meeting new clients. And fares, um, for better or worse, have become the most important vehicles, we believe, and I think um, I'd be curious to hear Stuart and Allison's um, uh, points on that, but I think you know, fares have become extraordinarily powerful mechanisms for meeting new clients. Um, you make sales at fares, 46%, 50%, 25%, whatever it is. There are sales that come from fares, um, but exposure, building your brand, building the market that you serve, meeting new people, and all the leads that are generated as a result of that um, is an incredibly important part of our fares. And I think it was interesting just in, in Claire's survey this year to really focus on that data point because I think when we at Art Basel are making decisions, a lot of it is about how do we bring new people to the market? How do we um, not only get the known knowns, right? Uh, you know, we want major museum directors and, and the alpha collectors of the world to come to our Art Basel shows, but in Hong Kong especially, in Miami Beach especially, these are, these are fairs that serve vast regions that for some period of time were underserved arguably with, in, uh, with respect to the broader market, you know, mm -hmm. unlocking the Asian market for example, you know, and Stuart goes, um, he's going to Beijing uh, <laughs> in two days to that one of his artists has a show in mainland China for the first time, you know, and that's really important for us to be able to get to know collectors and institutions in those markets and, and ensure through the context of our shows that people can come and meet. And I think to answer your question, clearly fairs are about sales. No gallery, any gallery that says otherwise is lying to your face. <laughs> said they don't want to make money at an art fair. And, and I think That's for sure. Fair director who uh, says and as a fair director, it's our fundamental duty to make sure that the, the economics of what we provide to our clients in the end are galleries um, add up. And if we fail in that, we fail over time. Um, but beyond that, it's about making new introductions mm -hmm. and, and serving their business. We want um, collectors, curators, the international media, et cetera, students to be inspired at fairs and ultimately go back to those galleries, you know, in the East End, go to, you know, go to Berner Street to see Allison's space for the first time and build those relationships deeper. And you've both said actually that from the mega fairs, you have had, sorry, major fairs, you have had, um, you've had people come to your, come to your galleries afterwards. Um, do, do they also keep buying? I mean, do you meet new clients? Do you stay as clients? It's not just a one-off. Oh, uh, definitely, um, on the whole, it's not just like one, we're not looking for one yeah. transaction. And there have definitely been times where I have said that I don't even want any more clients. Hmm. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, the uh, market tends to go for artists that are already highly in demand and there's already extensive waiting lists for those artists. So, but I, I, yeah, I mean, uh, art fairs, we've met clients that have gone on to become our hmm. biggest loyal followers. So. That's a lovely link actually to Mark because that's one way that the art business is not like any other business you probably come across. Um, <coughs> that actually you need to manage your sales to a certain extent in your business um, so it's not too much. But I just wondered, I take your point that actually maybe the art market was, uh, was unusual in that it, it, according to Claire's numbers it went up maybe more than other um, investments but it, what struck me from the report actually is how global wealth and, and dynamics in global wealth seem to map a lot of the dynamics in the global art market. And I just wondered if you could give us a quick rundown of the, which areas wealth seemed to grow in and how your, how your clients in those areas were thinking. Sure. Well, uh, now, okay. Uh, certainly, the, you know, the U.S. remains uh, the number one home for billionaires, mm -hmm. and that's reflected, I think, in some of these stats. But Asia is growing rapidly, uh, three billionaires a week in Asia as a whole and two in China per week. So that trend is something that's going to continue whatever happens uh, one year to the next in either the financial or the art markets. Hmm. So, and just to pick up a little bit on that in, in Asia, because we did, I mean, I think that the, the drop in China is quite alarming because I think we've all been rather reliant on China as a growing market, but, and, and Claire also, you did point out some problems with buy, high buy-in rates and non-payment. And 57% uh, again last year, I mean, when the market kind of started to open up in 2003, 2004, 
it was only about a third of the, of the market was bought in, but now mm. it's up to 57%. So more than half of the stuff that comes onto the market is not sold, which shows that there's a huge volume of, of, <laughs> of material, of supply. But um, I think collectors are becoming more wary and discerning, which is a, in some ways mm. a good sign. It's a sign of the market maturing a little bit too. But, um, but overall, you're positive about Asia in the longer term, and actually not just China. I wondered if you could just talk a bit about other, you know, we've a bit, we just saw an auction here, quite a bit more buying. It seemed from Japan, even South Korea, Taiwan. How, how do you see the whole? Well, uh, I think China is the driver for much of what we'll see going on in Asia for the next any number of years, I think. By 2030, by 2030, uh, I th China's economy is projected to be something like 10 times the size of Germany's. Um, the, China had a rough year last year. It's going through a difficult period in a way because the Chinese leadership has decided to try and transition the economy from one based on fixed investment to one more based on uh, consumption to reduce the outstanding uh, debt in the, in the economy, in, in part because they felt they had the room to do that. Now, when the, the U.S. trade conflict came on top of that, mm -hmm. I think it did upset in, investors, certainly, of all, of all kinds. Um, I, a colleague of mine in Asia made the observation, which I think is true, is that many of our clients in Asia are first generation wealth or, or second generation, they're still very involved in their businesses. And so the turnover in their businesses perhaps can impact their consumption uh, or investment in art a bit more than in other parts of the world. Okay, more directly, but in but next generation things are looking good. No, did you want to add something? Well, I was only going to say through personal experience, but also just generally following the trajectory of our business mm. in Hong Kong over the last mm. number of years. I mean, I think in the early days, people thought of Art Basel Hong Kong and they thought of mainland China. And the, the two as, as exhibitors and people yes. coming, that that was the connection. Um, and it's proven in the way to be uh, it correct at some level, clearly, because on the one hand, as Mark was saying, a lot of the, the region is driven by what's coming from the mainland. But on the other hand, it's entirely incorrect in the sense that the region is so more broad and dynamic than that. Um, you know, Art Basel Hong Kong, in many ways, the biggest annual event of the year for the Australian art market, or mm. you know, the, the New Zealand art market. There's more people coming from India. You see cross pollination from, uh, you know, there was a big collector group from Mexico that came to Hong Kong last year. So that interchange from one region of the world to the next is really um, it's happening. And I think it relates to what Claire is talking about in her research with the data on millennials that you were referring to, where you said that millennials actually have more in common with their own generation wherever they are in the world than they do necessarily with um, you know people from different <laughs> generations in terms of their collecting interest from their you know from their own region um, you know in the early days of art Basel Miami when we'd survey collectors you'd see collectors from Latin America increasing annually and then all of a sudden it sort of leveled off and we didn't really understand what had happened what had happened basically is that people from Latin America were purchasing homes in the US over that period and identifying as Americans and no longer as Latin mm. Americans. And so those changes happen through culture. Mm. That's why I think Claire's research also just on the broader economic impact of the art market is so um, important because the spillovers in different ways are really strong. Um, and you know, as practitioners within this field, you know, it's all of our job to sort of navigate that as best we can. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to move on a bit because I don't think we can sit here in London this week, this month, and not talk a bit about Brexit. Um, sorry. Um, but I was, I mean, Claire, I was, uh, it's interesting that it, it, you, you seem to be saying that actually it's going to be more of a problem for the EU um, than it well, is for it, the Probably in terms of the size of the, it's going to look at my, the, the, these global pies, yes. looking at the EU is going to be very different um, for the next few years with the UK out. It really has been the driver of of growth in, in the European art market. When we've talked about the growth of the EU, it's been, mm. you know, in, in, in the report, it's, you know, it's between 60 and 70% of the value of sales. And this is the value. There's a huge volume of sales that obviously happens all the way, all through Europe, but the value is very much being dominant here in London. Mm. And as I was saying, it's not um, 
based on necessarily just on British collectors. It's about the auction houses and, and dealers assembling this critical mass of things that come from all over the world to be bought and sold um, mm. here in London. Um, and it's, it's been the kind of the conduit for the low cost uh, channel for, for things to get into the market through the, the regulatory structure here. It's always been the lowest um, center for import yes. VAT. It's and nice. you know, if, if the nice UK gets, gets out of that directive completely, which is, you know, it's on the cards, it's not, nobody knows, but if it could, could if that was a European directive, if the import VAT here goes down to zero, that could be quite favorable here. Yes. So you've got, <laughs> you've got zero instead of 5%. And then even if France goes to the minimum um, of 5%, it still has to compete. If it's, if it's something's coming from the US, it has to compete with zero. Hmm. So, I mean, it's more, it's more complex than that, you know, it depends where the thing ends up, but, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it's um, what I would worry about is the, the you know, the trade is, continues to happen around these three hubs and Europe becomes a kind of a lower priced um, market altogether that's kind that's of so for, for, cer for certain segments and for lower prices in the market. So it could, could be still quite healthy markets, but on a much lower, lower <coughs> level, lower price level. Thank you. And Stuart, Alison, I mean, you must, you must have a sense of it. Do you get much of a sense of it here? And what sort of things have you had to do in the run-up, how are you looking at your business? Well, <coughs> certainly, once it was announced, once it was announced, we uh, just in terms of my staff, I had certain staff that were on <coughs> various different visas, and mm. that we immediately noticed a, a tightening at the Home Office on who was, oh, wow. you know, how flexible. So we 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 began to see this like two years ago. Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, in terms of I mean, it's literally unfolding as we speak mm. in, in the Houses of Parliament what's, whether the, this deal is going to go through. But, and I don't know the consequences of that deal, but certainly in terms of um, some initial preparation, we have Eva Rothschild representing Ireland at the Venice Biennale. That had to be shipped uh, last mm. month. Um, I think we were just talking that people are actually advising us to ship mm. our Basel boobs nah. now. Wow because there could be um, subject to all sorts of um, complications and delays and, and basically to be kind of deprioritized in terms of exporting work. So I, I don't know the, uh, you know, the, none of us know the ins and outs of that because it's just not clear. It's in fact, it's battling with the unknown, isn't yeah. it? That you're just trying to preempt what could I think the ups, I mean, there have been upsides and downsides to Brexit, mm. and I say that with a kind of moral dilemma myself as a firm Remainer. Um, but, you know, initially, I've, the last two years, we've seen an increase in sales, so the pound is weaker. Yes. Um, when over, I would imagine that most UK galleries do do around, depends, we, we've sort of a, avoided um, the Asian market to date. That's been a conscious decision, and perhaps a foolish one, I don't know, but <laughs> we focused on, okay, you know, we have a... Okay, by 2030, <laughs> that's when it's really going to get okay. big, so you've got well, 11 years. We're getting there, but um, 11 it's a lifestyle choice more than anything, but 50-50, you know, America, Europe, and um, the Americans, it has been absolutely boosted sales. The pound is, is weaker, mm. the dollar is stronger, and um, we've actually been asked to do more sales, um, I guess, in more sterling sales Pounds, than normal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> super interesting. Um, the really the big downside um, I've noticed is that over half my key UK clients have gone non-DOM. So yes. and they're not here. And they're not here to, not just not, of course, you, we still sell to them because they have houses yes, all around the world. Yes, how much of a difference does it make to have them physically? It's not so much the sales because, um, we do still, I mean, that's where art fairs come into play. That's mm. why art fairs are so crucial because you are seeing people at art fairs face to face, not just on the phone or by email. But um, what I miss about those clients is the dialogue we had and the fact that they will attend your shows, they will attend your openings, they will come to the dinner, meet the artists, yep. sit yeah. with the curators. And that's just, I can see that getting even worse. And actually, it's not as if there were that many UK collectors compared to say in the US and, and even Europe. But I mean, that, the interesting thing I thought about the report when I first saw it and then I clarified it with Claire was, you know, the way that the UK <laughs> seemed like this massive market. And when you talk to some of the foreign galleries who've come here and opened big spaces, quite often, depending on whether they you know, how well you know them and how honest they're going to be, for some I think it was a bit of a shock that there wasn't 
you know, it isn't this massive art market yes. in the UK. A lot of trade happens here. Exactly. And auction is, is huge, but also galleries, a lot of galleries. Here. Yeah, and, but the fairs are crucial because unless you're doing the circuit of the key fairs, mm. and obviously the Basel brand is top of that, absolutely. But even, you know, the more other fairs you do, the more likely you are to meet somebody who could go on to... I mean, I when the first year I did Basel, um, some collectors came onto my stand and um, I learned a long time ago never to, to um, not to expect anything, never judge a book like by its cover, dating. you know, and Take these collectors off. came onto my stand and I know their experience on other big, some of the bigger galleries is they are dismissed, they are just, you know, no one, no one takes them seriously even if they ask a price. They've I mean, that, that was kind of 2011. And I think they've spent maybe five or six million in the huh. since. Are they so UK? They're American, okay. but without Art Basel, I wouldn't have met them. Huh. And that's the dilemma with fairs. You want to do less because you're on this hamster wheel of mm. costs and travel as well. And you get less time in your gallery, less time mm. to read, less time to research and think about great exhibitions. But on the other hand, if you look at every single fair you do, and I'm sure Stuart will agree with me on this, it's rare that you don't meet someone that translates later on down the line. I mean, Freeze New York, I don't do it anymore, um, largely because I don't want to do a fair that's just a 24-hour fair in, you know, Randall's Island, the location is wrong. Yes. So, but having said that, the last time I did Freeze New York, I met a European client who, again, has go on, gone on to spend significant amounts mm. with us, and not only that, has a museum, and so curatorially, it's been brilliant as well. Um, that's that's the that's the way up, but I, I still think it comes down to, and I think more galleries are thinking this now. There is art fair fatigue, mm. and that's not going to affect the major fairs. You know, Basel Art Fair is one of the few fairs you will go around at seven o'clock in the evening throughout most of the week, and the the big dealers are still on their stands, and they're still there for a reason because there's mm. business to be done because all the collectors are there, hmm. and. Um, I just think that um, you could take some of the dilution of energy and money and effort if you don't do some of those small affairs and put it into a fair like Basel <laughs> and, and, incre and increase Very your revenue from Basel. Basel because at the end of the day, Noah's absolutely right. Yes, we curate our stands at fairs. Yes, we want to preserve that curatorial integrity. But at the end of the day, you're there to sell. And mm -hmm. if you get it right, a fair like Basel can potentially you know, keep you afloat if a recession strikes. Mm. You can do a lot of business at a fair like Basel or Miami Basel. And, and if you get the material right, as we saw this week, even in a kind of less than ideal surroundings of the Armoury show, yes. you can actually... Yeah, you had a great, um, you great can, Dorothea Tanning. Um, you, can, you can make it count. Mm. Can I just... Um, can I just go back one step? Because there are a couple of things I want to follow up on that. But actually, just I promise I will leave Brexit very, very soon. But Mark, I just want to ask you, because a lot of um, big galleries and auction houses say to me, who, who are based here, say to me, it doesn't, Brexit doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to our clients at all. Right? They're super wealthy, don't care about a little bit of you know, legal, technical problems there in, in London. Are your clients, are the super, or the wealthy, or the high net worth individuals, are they worried about Brexit at the moment? Well, we've, uh, they certainly think about it a lot in terms of what it means for the world that one of the world's most respected democracies is going through these uh, uh, mm. interesting times. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, it, but it really is a topic around the world. I mean, we, we've had, it's, uh, it's public knowledge. We had Gordon Brown speak uh, in Hong Kong and and Singapore to clients, and they're they're very fascinated with every aspect of this. I think how that translates into the art market. I think you've spoken very well about the UK being a marketplace, and and that any any market for anything, stocks, bonds, art. Uh, is very much the quality of that market depends on the regulatory environment and, and what's going on with the currency. And so the, with those questions so very much up in the air, I can see why it's hard to make any fast pronouncements about what the future will be. We wait. We wait and see. Maybe, maybe we'll know one day. Um, you've led us beautifully to the future. Um, I'd love... Well, Claire, I suppose, first, how, 
what sort of thoughts, it sounds like people are a little more pessimistic about 2019. Um, do you expect that top number, you know, 60, we, we, the, the art market is sort of hovering between 60 and 70 the whole time, uh, sorry, billion. Mm. Do, you, here, do you get a sense now if that will come, do you expect that to come down a bit this year and why? Um, I, I, I never try and guess it's this <laughs> early in the year, but I mean, I think people, certainly talking to people at the end of last year and early this year, just more anecdotally, people were very worried and there were kind of, there was a sense that they were kind of relieved to, I mean, some people having their best year ever, but they were kind of relieved to have, have got through it and were worried mm. about the, the year going, going forward and whether that would be the same. So that kind of sense of things. But I think, you know, in terms of the, the figures and the surveys, if you look at people's one-year sentiment and their five-year sentiment, people are always worried about the immediate future. Um, you know, we, if you look in five years, they're, they're a lot more optimistic and <laughs> bullish about things. And this was dealers and collectors and, yeah. and auction houses. It'll so people, be fine. people are worried about the, the, the things. There's a lot of things going on in the world, and you know, as we, we discussed. Uh, yes. But I think when some of those things settle a little bit, people, um, you know, change their plans. But it, there seems to be a sense, it probably always happens, that, you know, the economic and political dynamics are feeding more into people's plans, or certainly more quickly. Yes. Um, people are kind of changing their, their outlook, or, or um, you know, maybe there's just more going on um, because it's such a global art market now that, that all of these things you have to factor in. But I think, you know, that people are worried about the immediate year, but certainly, you know, their five-year sentiment was pretty positive overall. Hmm. So, you know, it might be trouble times ahead, but I mean, it's very early in the year still. Yeah. Thank you. And then Stuart Allison, picking up a little bit of what Allison was just saying about, you know, dealers having to maybe curate their booths a bit more, doing fewer fairs. I mean, what is your, what do you, how are you attacking 2019, I suppose? Is that well, I think that um, a, this is not just for myself. I think a lot of the galleries that are within my uh, kind of demographic have always curated their art fair booths and um, mm. at times we've shown things that um, have already been sold at other times we've shown things that we know will never be sold <laughs> but it's it's a uh, also the economic gain is not the only goal of worth with an art fair and uh, I'm not relying on that system uh, to I mean, it was surprising to me that it was 50% of my turnover. Gallery sales. Yeah. But I, I, I didn't feel that it was in, my, in the way I felt about it. But really, you want to use the opportunity to tell a story about your gallery and a narrative about the program that you're doing and, and look at the intrinsic value of, of what can happen at an art fair. You know, an artist can get a major museum show, or you know, a curator sees this, includes them in a in a significant biennale, or all sorts of things can happen. Mm. And so we're also there to uh, uh, expecting a different kind of level of, of, of things other than sales. Yeah. And is there anything? I mean, do are you? Uh, you know, I noticed that, th that there's something in the report that says that millennials are actually, you know, tend to have less now, have less money than their parents. Are you courting millennials? Are you seeing a lot I of don't them? know any of them. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think don't age, know. age 22 to 37. But what, what I would say, I, I don't know what age bracket that means. I think it was yes, 22 <laughs> to 37. Okay, so what, what I would say about that is um, <laughs> there's a, two or three of the most impressive collectors that I have, that I know from London right now mm. are probably just under 40. And they are the most ambitious and, and really the collectors that we see as priority. So oh, that's great. I think that, but I wouldn't certainly Optimum. not look at them and think of them as millennials. <laughs> <laughs> They'd probably be delighted. <laughs> and Alison, what do you think for the year uh, ahead? Is there anything in particular you Well, it's interesting looking at the report because um, when you start to see pie charts and graphs and people <laughs> defined in terms of their age or their background and so on, so I just never have run my gallery like that. I've that's never... That's probably um, true about most people. Um, but I also think there's a distinction which probably isn't accounted for in the report between, when you say a gallery, I think there's a huge distinction between gallerists and dealers. Hmm. But some dealers may have these spaces and they're classed as gallerists, but that's a whole different thing. I mean, I think... As in a dealer is, is well, trading. Trading, trading, a lot more secondary market. Whereas so, a gallerist is... Um, I mean, I looked at my figures between primary and secondary market, and yeah. last year, you know, we had one of our best years, and we're 97% primary market. Okay, so the where you're nurturing yeah. and teaching. But the teaching. secondary market now starts to come in because our pri we're at a stage, you know, X number of years later, where our primary market 
artists, there is sec a substantial secondary market to be done, and you hope that that will come back to you rather than the auction houses. So um, I think that there's a kind of symbiosis that you have to embrace within the art world, mm. and it's not just sales. And I think Stuart made a really valid point on fairs, that whilst, yes, we absolutely have to sell at fairs, because um, unless you have a big backer or... Um, you know, another checkbook somewhere. <laughs> yes, yes. If a fair goes badly and it's cost you $200,000 to do it, then, you know, that's going to dent things and, and affect your for, year ahead. And for smaller dealers, it can be made. Smaller great. dealers, it's a question now of them even being able to afford to do those mm. art fairs because they, you know, you, it's so much cash up front. Mm. However, um, I think that there's so many layers that come into it, which is why at an art fair, you're not just looking for buyers, you're looking to talk to and engage with curators, writers, you know, uh, um, and I still stand by the model of a great gallery is it's all about your artists and it's all about selling to museums. And those sales will take far longer to come through. So mm. you can go to a fair and you can choose between selling it to um, Mr. Hedge Funder from New York or um, the Tate yes. or the Santa Pompidou or the Modern Amusette in Stockholm. And that sale might take six months for the mm. money to come through you have no choice in that because your gallery will not be sustained unless you sell to museums and you get your artists major museum shows. In a way that's why Claire's data on galleries not being able to borrow money but anyway we could we'll, yeah. I'm not going to go down that route now because I think we're running out of time but um, it makes it even more fundamental that if you can't <laughs> if you need money now you're going to take the hedge fund every yeah, but time. You can't do that if you want your gallery to stay open and you want to keep your artists because otherwise if you do that then when House and Worth come along or white cube or however it is, the artist will walk. Okay. Fascinating. Yes, no, you want to say Yeah, I mean, I just, um, just if, I mean, uh, do we open to the audience? Oh, we will very, yes, yeah, I was okay. just about to, but <laughs> you can. You um, no, I mean, I, I think um, there's a few things happening in the art market right now. I mean, mm -hmm. one, what was sort of unspoken, but I think is worth pointing out, is there's a huge generational shift in the collector base. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the known alpha collectors um, have are aging out of the art market some mm -hmm. level in terms of they're buying their, their collections are full, uh, which is one of the reasons that, you know, the number one thing that uh, dealers are looking for in the market now is new clients. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just a, a big thing that the market, it, you know, in its totality, it's not an art Basel concern, it's the market yep. is addressing. Um, uh, I think people come to fairs. I mean, it's really challenging, uh, for, I think, for galleries when they come because on the one hand, you want to see these clients that are your known clients. On the other hand, it's really tough in the context of a two or three or four day fair, even if it's more than one day, to really get to know who these clients are, mm. especially yes. the new ones um, or people from different parts of the world. You know, you just don't know. There's language barriers. Mm. Um, they might not be as knowledgeable or sophisticated off the bat of what they're asking about, yeah. but they could be you know, your anchor client of the future. So I think addressing that generational shift is a really key thing for the art market as a whole, certainly for the gallery and fair business. Um, you know, the other thing that we didn't really totally talk about, I think, is galleries increasing sophistication with regard to how they do fairs. Um, part of the reason that I think galleries are doing less fairs is because they're becoming more strategic about, um, about which fairs they're doing and why they're mm -hmm. doing those fairs. Um, you know, it's my firm opinion that you really have to make fairs work for you. You can't just work to perpetuate more fairs. And I think we will see gallerists in the coming years thinking in a more calculated fashion about what works, why it works, mm. and what you're trying to get out of it. And I think one of the real benefits um, and one of the things that we as an organization are most proud of in, in working with Claire and UBS to perpetuate this is to encourage the community to really think more about these things. And we are seeing galleries be more open than they ever have been about having candid conversations of what their turnover is, what their risks are, how to mitigate those risks mm. as a business, because you know it's, it's a cultural business. Um, so those are a few things generally in terms of where the auction market is going. And I think in terms of the overall numbers for the coming year, I mean, a lot of those are roughly half will be you know, predicated upon the auction sales. I mean, I have absolutely no idea. There's certainly some chitter chatter. But as chatter. in so far, well, there's chitter chatter in the. And I, the I sales we just had in London were about that they were definitely down on the previous. Yeah, year. and I think you know, in talking to the trade, there's a lot of discussion just around financing at auction, right? Yes. And 
if there is an easing up of guarantees backing the auction business in the coming year, that may well make a healthier market, but it may also... It may be a smaller, uh, healthier market. It may be a smaller, healthier market. So I couldn't tell you where that will go or if that's true, but that's something certainly for the market to be looking at um, in the coming period. Thank you for opening a whole new can of worms now. <laughs> I'm going to hold off there. I am going to let... Are there any questions... Oh, there's already. I was going to say otherwise I'll, I'll chip in. Hi. How are you? Hi, good. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Fred with... From the... Hello. Um, I've got a question for Mark, which is um, just looking into 2019 and the investment outlook for the year ahead. Um, what is UBS's kind of um, view on what its clients, net worth, high net worth clients, should be thinking about in terms of investing for the, for the year to come? Assets, uh, asset classes versus cash, um, particular regions. Um, what, what's the sort of themes that you're talking to your clients about? Sure. Well, uh, I think the, the biggest thing to think about when you're talking to ultra high net worth clients is uh, that they realize that you know they, they probably already have a lot of worth and so preserving it is more important maybe in, in turbulent times is more important than uh, making you know singular bets to to increase that wealth and what's really changed about the world is that we have these uh, very large economies pursuing very different political economies so you think about the austerity measures uh, in place on the European continent versus debt to GDP ratios well over 200 percent in Japan. The U.S. Uh, having the market uh, boom to a large degree in part based on a, on a fiscal stimulus taking place um, and of course now quantitative easing is coming out of the system. But what this means is that you, you now perhaps more than ever in history you want to diversify across these different regions because it's unclear which system is going to do the best. They're probably not all going to succeed very well. And so, you know, do you want to bet on the U.S. beating China in a trade war or do you want to bet on both countries? Uh, you know, why necessarily pick sides if you don't have to? I think that's the biggest issue. Then <clears throat> the second issue, I think, is one, you know, there are many asset classes, but stocks and bonds are, are often the, the choices that, that people gravitate to. There again, it's more challenging now because bond yields have hit a historic low and have bounced off of that. Um, and you talk about, we, we talked last year about did we move from a TINA market to a Tierra market, which is TINA is there is no alternative to stocks, and Tierra is there is a real alternative, which hmm. is uh, bonds or, or cash. And um, bond yields have fallen back a little bit, and so we're more now uh, constructive on equities because there aren't that many other sources of yield or return out, out there in the world. And so provided a few of these very binary events uh, turn out well, such as the uh, U.S.-China uh, trade war, we think that uh, it, it can still be a good year for assets, uh, risk assets like equities. Thank you very much. For, I've learned about Tina and Tierra. <laughs> Super. Um, any I other? Wrote that down. It's yeah, <laughs> it's great, isn't Fantastic. it? Fantastic. <laughs> Are there any other questions at all? Oh, yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, this is a question to all of you, or any of you. Do you actually see the contemporary art market? as one in which high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals should invest as an asset class. Because we've all talked about it for 10 or 20 years. We're all sitting here, and some of us might be sitting here slightly more nervous than the rest of us about where those markets go for one reason or another, either as a collector or as an investor, as a business person. And it's interesting that you haven't touched on that today, because I think that's a sort of one of the reasons why we're all here listening to this report to get a feel for where you know, is this an alternative asset, finally or not? I, I have opinions, but I'm not here to have that opinion. I mean, uh, do, do, is art an alternative asset? I mean, we were talking earlier, but I, I think 
you know, well, passion investment, uh, the contradiction in terms, but you may have. I mean, we do have a house view on uh, assets, and so we we don't we think that art has. Uh, you know, many returns uh, beyond financial returns, but we don't consider it an asset class that we actively tell our clients to uh, invest in the way that they, they would their other assets, like stocks, bonds, real estate, and that, that sort of thing. Stuart, Allison, I'm I mean, sure you Yeah, I mean, I definitely would try to avoid, like, framing it as an asset. Um, but, I mean, there has been a kind of proven track record uh, of certain works being bought at very low value mm. that can then um, quadruple or even more, you know, within, within some time. And, you know, the problem with that is then to what end and to how, how if, if they're going to liquidate that, then how, how is that done? And that's kind of the big concern that we come across uh, when people are, you know, do they go to the auction market, which then has a set of consequences to it. Um, but certainly, I think that um, some people, whether people should look at it or not, if people are spending the types of money mm. and the level of investment that they make, I think that it's completely fair that they mm. would see and expect that to hold its mm. value. in the world per se? I think the rise of the art market is down to lots of different things. One thing we haven't really talked about is the internet. Yes. When I opened my gallery, um, we didn't have the internet. In fact, I was telling <laughs> the others, this one day this man turned up at the door and asked us if we would like to try having an email address. <laughs> but um, we don't do what we call online sales, um, or very, very rarely. But what we do do is we do a lot of business by sending, uh, communicating to our clients through the internet. And I think that that's really uh, a major, major thing that's really... And that's grown the volume as well as, I mean, that, that's, I just think, I think general interest, I think you're absolutely right to a certain extent, wealth growth and the growth of the art market and that, but there's also, everyone's just much more aware of art. Um, I was gonna say, Claire had the interesting statistics mm. of, uh, of uh, just a survey, I think it was 600 people, 86% in the United States said that they've never sold something from their collection. So I guess if you have an asset where 86% <laughs> of it is getting pulled out of the market never to return, uh, you know, that would speak to the rise and to the extent, I mean, nobody knows if that's gonna continue or not. And Claire, now I think you've both written books about it. I mean, do you have <coughs> views on how, if we should look at art as an investment? I'm just to clarify about the report itself. I mean, this is in by absolutely no means a, a guide to investment or anything. First of all, it's all looking at past performance, and that, that's the problem. I mean, it might be something to consider. You can see how you've done relative to the to, oh, to other like sectors. It. And I mean, there mm. is chapters in the report that look at post-war and contemporary and living artists and all the different segments, so you can see how you've tracked but it doesn't it doesn't give any advice or offer any ideas of what what would be a good investment mm. so i mean i think pe people have different points of view i mean i've come the full circle in my own personal kind of views on it from when i started out very much doing a lot of quants and econometrics to then my current thing where i'm just kind of measuring and, and assessing things so but i think there as is people you, that have you an used to look at it as an asset whereas more now it, that's like just it. in the, the job mm. i was in originally we, there were a lot of people interested in it that way but um I think most of the people I, I meet uh, look at it in a different way. The, the only thing about the reselling thing, in some of the countries, the millennials were uh, the much higher level, they're more willing to sell things from their collections. So that is changing, it is um, becoming more. Everything but it, it's, is getting faster. It's the key thing that people keep asking to, to get done is forecasting and what these reports and what indices and what all of these things cannot do is tell you what the future is. They're only a good guide to whether you've kind of beaten the market in the past. So that's the thing about the report, it's not gonna tell you um, even you know, at a very micro level, it's a very macro level industry um, report that's designed to <coughs> really just give some benchmark kind of sticks in the sand to w where the market's going um, over time. But it, it's not going to help you necessarily well, what to do in future, <laughs> where to put your money, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, it's an inherently loaded and tricky question <laughs> too, right? Mm. Like we always get asked, like if you had X amount of money, what would you do with it? You know, and it's kind of a ridiculous question. I mean, I think 
there, it's both cliched but also true to say that art truly is a passion product, right? I mean, mm. people are invested and are involved in it because of reasons that go well above and beyond the thrill of the chase or just the, you know, investing or buying a young artist in the hopes that um, things will skyrocket. But clearly, um, you know, art's viability as an asset is related to its liquidity. And, you know, like the success of artists is related to the success of the galleries that they work with and how diligently and thoroughly and, and um, strategically they place their work in, in, you know. And I think on a whole, as an organization, you know, we feel that what we do as an organization is to support the great galleries. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we like to think of people really investing in artists, but really in the galleries. It's a relationship between a collector and a gallerist. Um, you know, and, and another thing that I've certainly found, uh, you know, in my time researching and writing this, you know, that many people don't totally appreciate is that gallerists in many ways are the greatest art investors because everything yes. you do as a gallerist is building, like if you were in isolation going to build your hypothetical art investment fund, you'd want to source material, you'd want to create a mechanism to boost the value of it and to create a meaning and narrative mm. around it, and you'd want to be able to place that to market, mm. which is what great gallerists do already, mm. which is... You know, one of the, the, the tricks, of course, is a, as, a, as a, you know, sort of a non-gallerist participant in that market trying to come in and, and play the market or game the market, which is why you see certain people gaming very specific niches of it to, to, to make a return. And sometimes it works brilliantly and, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, That's very true. Excellent. Thank you. I've got time for one more-ish, if there is one more. And if not, I think we're going to break. And I just really want to say a massive, massive thank you to Claire, to Alison, to Stuart, to Mark, to Noah. You've been fascinating, as ever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.